In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned before the service began, and we see in our bulletin, today is the day that we remember St. Luke, one of the four evangelists. We don't know for sure what happened to him. We don't have a great account of most of the early Christians and their fates, but according to tradition, he finally died a martyr's death, which is why the day is marked with red. In fact, of the four evangelists, John is the only one who's remembered with white because as much as we know, while he was sent into exile for quite some time, he died a natural death. And red is the color then that we use for the church, for the martyrs, and also then for the work of the Holy Spirit because of the tongues of fire that came down upon the disciples at Pentecost. And it's nice that the day fell on a Sunday this year since we've been plugging along with all sorts of health issues, not just in ourselves, in our congregation, or those around us, but you can't read the news or watch something on television or internet or listen to anything on the radio for very long before somebody reminds you to put on your mask, wash your hands, alcohol up, stay away from people if you think you're sick. If Somebody in the next room over was sick, you might want to lock yourself down for a while too. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody could just make it go away? When we sang the hymn stanza specific to Luke a few moments back, for that beloved physician, all praise whose gospel shows the healer of the nations, the one who shares our woes. Your wine and oil, O Savior, upon our spirits pour, and with true balm of Gilead, anoint us evermore. The oil, which was used for many anointings, oftentimes connected with the work of the Holy Spirit, the wine, which medicinally is wine or acidic vinegar, could cleanse wounds and keep worse infections from developing. They didn't have all of our antibiotics. They didn't have tanks of oxygen on hand. They didn't have defibrillators hanging in buildings all over the place. But what they had, they used. But it doesn't really make any difference. We have tanks of oxygen. We have antibiotics. We have antivirals. We have smart people working on vaccines. And still, people get sick, whether it's a cold or whether it's COVID. Their bodies break down, whether it's a heart attack or cancer or any one of a number of other things. As Isaiah reminded us, there are deaf people, there are blind people, there are lame people, there are mute people, all need help. And the Lord reminds us then in today's psalm that he is the one who helps. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, gathers the outcasts of Israel, heals the brokenhearted, binds up their wounds. The Lord brings healing. We sometimes speak of him as the song did, as our great physician. Luke himself, Dr. Luke, if you will, was also a physician. And I imagine that when he heard about Jesus' miracles of healing, he paid special attention to them. We see a few times that his gospel is the only one that records certain things that are medically related, such as the cleansing of the ten lepers. And even Jesus' virgin birth something he as a doctor had not seen in his lifetime or heard about from whoever he studied under. But there it was. The intricacies of the body and the way it could fall apart or get ill and also then the ways that it could be helped and healed. And so today, with him who became Paul's personal physician, the only one who Paul says was with him at that time, some of his people he had sent off to be pastors elsewhere, such as Titus and 
Crescens, some who had just run off from him like Demas, and some <coughs> in the area who just actively opposed him. But Luke tended to Paul while he was in captivity. In fact, this time in 2 Timothy, it's often thought that was Paul's second Roman captivity. We believe he was out for a time. And at the end of this book, he was very near the end of his life also. And it wouldn't be sickness or accident that would finally claim him. According to the church's traditions, it was the Roman emperor's displeasure with him because he was teaching something that they saw foreign, alien, hurtful to the empire. And according to tradition, he was beheaded. But however that happened, Luke was a faithful companion. Luke was a good doctor. And Luke ultimately is one who points to our great physician. Because, believe it or not, you're sick. I mean, I can look out here, and I know some of your ailments and illnesses. We've talked about it with one another. Some of them are on display. If you have to do this every once in a while, like I'm starting to do more and more now, that's a pretty good clue that maybe you're not, either not hearing or not paying attention as well as you should, and I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say it's your hearing. You may not walk as well as you used to. You may not see as well as you used to. I mean, I see multiple pairs of eyeglasses out here. You may not have all of your own teeth anymore, although if you paid for them, I guess they're still your own teeth. You may, as they say, have a hitch in your giddy-up. You're a little stiff when you get out of bed or when you stand up from a chair or even just rolling over in bed. All of a sudden, from being a groggy, flipping over to the other side, you're almost fully awake because it hurt that much. But what you're really sick from is none of those things. It's not some insidious disease that's eating away inside of you, and maybe they haven't even told you you've got it yet. It's not that your arteries are clogging up, that certain organs aren't working as well as they should that even memory might be fading or anything else. No, we all share one common sickness, and that is sin. It's the sin that we're born with. It's the sin that we continue to commit. It's the sin that piles up against us. Because all these illnesses, any accidents that we have, any damage that comes to our bodies is slowly and steadily pointing us down the path where our bodies will no longer function at all, when our lives will cease. It may not be any of the things that we're carrying around with us right now. It may be something completely different. But all of us, because we are sin sick, know that we will die. And we can't heal ourselves from that. Still. Even with a defibrillator, they may pop you back awake and moving around, and maybe you'll go on for years. With a heart attack, your heart may stop, but if they get in there and do the right things at the right time, your heart will start again. In fact, they may give you new organs, kidneys or liver or heart itself, and keep you plugging away for a few more years. But finally, whether it's what you were born with or what they put into you, it's all going to shut down. And no doctor, from Mizzou to the Mayo Clinic, no cancer center, whether it's in Kansas City or Houston or any place else, no vaccine, no wonder drug is going to put death to death. But yet the Lord says, have hope. The Lord says good things are coming. The brokenhearted will be healed and our wounds will be bound up. The physical heartaches that we have because of things wrong in our body and the spiritual heartaches that we have, the mental heartaches we have because people don't love us as the way they used to. People betray us. Things just don't go our way. All of those things need healing and in Christ they are healed. And sometimes, because we're just one little person in one podunk town, 
or some podunk farm outside of a podunk town, we start thinking how small and insignificant we really are. And out in the country, especially, if you can go outside on a moonless night and see all of those other lights up in the sky, you start thinking, well, how many more stars are there than I can see? And we remember that some of those little dots of light aren't individual stars. They're whole galaxies with millions and millions of stars in them. Billions, perhaps. But yet God knows every one of those stars. He has a first name relationship with them. And God knows you. And the stars are good and they're pretty and they're shiny. Up close, they're hot and scary and can melt you in a flash. But they're just stars. They're part of God's earlier creation. He saved us. He saved Adam and Eve for the end, if you will, the best for last. And even though we betrayed the trust that he gave us, even though our first parents fell into sin and we fall into step right behind them, he still loves us. He still wants us to be his own. He still calls us by name in baptism. And anytime he tells us in general, I have loved you with everlasting love, you can plug your own name in there also. Because that everlasting love is not only for us. It's for each one of us. It is for you. Your broken heart healed. Your wounds bound up. And finally, your corpse or whatever remains of you in whatever condition you are in, however many days, years, decades, centuries, millennia, it is until the end, on the end, a fully formed, fully functioning human body will be united with a spirit that is faithful and true and whole. And because there will be no sin, there will be no suffering. There will be no more falling apart. You won't need to go to the doctor, let alone the great physician, because you will be living with that physician. And he won't have anything to heal anymore because you will be whole and hearty. You're not just going to be patched up and sent on your way, like mom put a Band-Aid on your knee or wrapped you up your cut finger or whatever and said, go on out and play, I'm busy now. No, you are going to be absolutely and completely healthy. No more cupping your ear, no more adjusting your glasses or cleaning them because they're so smudged that you don't know if you see worse with them or without them. No looking for a stick to help you walk along unless maybe... Paradise has a mountain you want to climb. You won't need any artificial aids. You won't need any outside healing. You will be healthy. You will be whole. And that will be you forever and ever. Because you will have every good thing that God wants you to have. You will be every good thing that God wants you to be. As I said, Luke pointed out a lot of the healing that Jesus brought. But... The psalmist talks about it here. Isaiah talks about it. The whole Bible is filled of what happened after the fall and how God has continually worked to fix it, to heal it, to restore it, to bring it back to where it should be. Whether it's his own people who have run off from him, Jerusalem, Zion, in our psalm. Whether it's we ourselves, who catch a bad case of sin on top of the regular sin we already have and really go to town in rebellion against him. Whether it's heart attack, whether it's cancer, whether it's blindness, deafness, whatever it is, it's not just going to be a temporary fix, it is going to be a forever fix. Christ suffered our pain, our suffering, our wounds, our illnesses in his own body not because he was a sinner, but because he carried our sin. And when that sin died in him, that means that he also now can put our sin to death. 
as he does in baptism, as he does every time he forgives us, as he does when we hear his word proclaimed, when we read it ourselves from the scriptures, when we taste and see he is good in his supper, in whatever way imaginable that God comes to us, he is coming to us with health and healing and restoration and with the promise that the best is yet to come. The new you, the whole you, the perfect, wonderful, holy you is still to come. But God already treats you that way. God already loves you that way. And God wants to keep you in faith so that you can enjoy the fullness of it when you are raised up on the last day. So whether living or dead, when the Lord finally comes back, you will be alive in a way you can't even imagine right now. Even the things that you were born with that weren't quite right will be right. Every creak, every groan, every moan of your body will be an ancient memory if you remember it at all. And you will celebrate. God cares enough for us to heal our earth, to heal his creation, to heal us. And he will one day wholly and completely heal every one of us that having bound our wounds and brought health to them, he will bring us to him that we might enjoy everlasting health and life and peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace that surpasses understanding keep you in Christ Jesus. Amen.